Hi, welcome to Stats Video 1.2, where we're going to discuss mean, median, spread, center, outliers, box plots, and comparison data. So let's just dive on in. This is a little Dilbert comic that was in one of the textbooks. And so calculating the mean. So this is our definition of what a mean is and a basic definition of the formula. You probably kind of know how to do this, so let's just dive on in. Find the mean travel for all of our 15 North Carolinian workers. As you can see, it's on the side. Um, so they gave us a stem plot. And the, bit, but the best thing to do here is to go ahead and just start, ah, there's my pen, to start calculating. So this represents 5 plus 10 plus 10 plus blah, 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 blah. And so you'd put all these numbers, 10, 12, 15, 20, 20, 25, 30, 30, 40, 40, 60, all the way to 60. And I've already done this calculation, so I know that it's 337. But we have to divide by the actual n value. And in this case, it's 15 North Carolinian. So 337 divided by 15 becomes 225. And I cannot forget my units minutes. Okay, so this was for number one. It wanted us to find that mean travel. And so we'll go ahead and write that, that it was 225 minutes. But what happens if we take out that one random person who said that it takes them 60 minutes to get to work every day, an hour? Okay, so we do it again. We add 5 and 10 and 10 and all the way. But this time I'm going to stop at 40. I don't need that uh, 60 value. So I end up with 227. But am I going to divide by the 15 North Carolinians? No, because we removed this person it now becomes 14 so that 15 minus 1 so I've already done this calculation and we end up with 19.8 minutes so the big thing here is to just recognize what this means and why it's relevant so a couple different things I can talk about uh, the 19.8 means that this one observation of 60 minutes raises the mean by 2.7 minutes. So that one person, that one extra person who said 60 minutes creates a rise in the mean of 2.7 minutes. And what this means is we're going to talk about a uh, vocab word called resistant measure of center. And so in this case, ah, I didn't mean to cross it out. In this case, this information, this data, is not a resistant measure of center. Why? Because that 160 minute changed our mean drastically. 2.7 minutes in the grand scheme of things, if it's only 22 and 19, 2.7 minutes is a major change. And so it's not resistant to the measure of change. If I calculated a mean and that 160 minute changed it from 22.5 to 22.6 or 22.4, then it was resistant. It was a resistant measure of center. That means that those outliers we don't quite know the definition of that just yet but that one random that unusual report that 60 minute report couldn't really affect the actual mean uh, average time this happens with sometimes larger samples sometimes samples that have a really good measure of center it just kind of depends on what's going on the other thing to notice I just clicked my other button I'm so sorry the other thing to know is that the mean tells us how large each data value would be if the total were equally split amongst all observations uh, it has a physical active physical representation and I'll show you all that in class on Thursday of next week or Wednesday was it I can't remember I have a little activity for you guys but let's move on to the median you guys should know what the median is at this point uh, you've got some information right here you can pause you can copy you can do whatever you need to but recognize that the median is that midpoint that's the big thing the mean is the average the midpoint the median is the midpoint so let's look at this information we have that same North Carolinian stem plot and they want us to calculate the median first and foremost you read my hint we're gonna place them in ascending order and so that becomes uh, 5, 10, 10, 10, 10, 12, 15, 20, 20, 25, 30, 30, 40, 40, 60. I think I read that correct. Okay. And so I see there's 15 because this is an odd number, an odd sample. That means there must be one value in the very center. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And this is my middle value. So the median for this particular stem plot would be 20. Okay. But what happens if it's an even sample? So now we're looking at instead of North Carolinian travel times to work, we're now looking at New York State's travel times to work. And so we have an even amount. So 20 samples. So again, you're going to 
order it in the correct order. Um, in this case, a stem plot might be our easiest method. I've already done it, so I'm just going to copy it down. 0, 5, 1, 0, 0, 5, 5, 5, 5. But this would be a good self-check if you were struggling with, uh, what's it called? stem and leaf plots and you're like okay well if your stem and leaf plot can match mine you're probably doing it correctly i don't think it's the two digit numbers that confuse y'all though so i'm not super concerned with this okay so again i can count off or i could rename it but one two three four five six seven eight nine ten and one two three four five six seven eight nine and ten so my value is going to be between 20 and 25 so you can take the average so I took the average and I got 22.5 minutes. So that would be the median of this even example. Again, odd, there were an odd number of samples, 15 people. Even, there are an even number of samples, 20 New Yorkers. So that's what we mean by that. Okay. Ah. I already did that. Okay, so comparing mean and median. The bigger thing to recognize here when we're comparing our mean and our median is that we're using the kind of correct language. We know, uh oh, no. Hold on one second. Hopefully that'll save me. All right. So we know that we've got some language. We've got symmetric and uh, skewed. And so I'd like to just show you that image because I, I'm not sure how great Schmoop's video was or image was for this. So I found I found what I think is a very good image. And you can actually see that there are there's language that's associated with this symmetry and skewed. It doesn't just mean what does it look like. There's actually specific. If your mean, median, and mode are about the same, then that's what we call a symmetric distribution. If your mean happens to be on the larger end, then that means that you're going to skew to the right. That means your tail is on the larger end. You're going to skew to the right. Uh, if your mean is on the lower end, then that means you're going to skew to the left and your mode is on the higher end and your mode is on, okay? There are, there. some people do use a slightly different language, so I have that image as well. The right-hand skew could also be called a positive skew or a left modal. The Left-hand skew could also be called a negative skew or a right modal. So in this class, we'll probably use this more often. But just in case you see this, I don't want you to freak out the same language. Okay, so check your understanding. Based on only the stem plot, what would you expect the mean travel to time to be less than, about the same as, or larger than the mean, and why? So we've got that same information about the uh, New York workers. We already found that the median was 22.5. And so if you're just looking at the, same, the, the stem plot, they're asking you to compare the mean, the average, to the median, that middle point. So what would you kind of guess? So this is a kind of a self-check for you. I'm not going to answer this question. I'm giving you something to think about for next week's class. Use your calculator to find that actual mean. So take a second, solve the average, and then justify your answer with the true appropriate data. So you're going to do a speculation, do the actual math, and then use comparison language. And guys, they even gave you an example of comparison language. This is technically comparison language right here. All right, spread and interquartile range. So here's some information, a formula you might need, but let's just dive on into it. Okay, so we've got this North Carolina travel data. Again, determine our, we're going to determine our Q1, our Q3, and then the interquartile range, which is going to help us understand the concept of an outlier in just a little bit. So the best thing to do here is let's just put it out in numeric order and in ascending order. So I've got 5, 10, 10, 10. 10, 12, 15, 20, 20, 25, 30, 30, 40, 40, 60. Sorry, I went over it. So the next thing we want to do is we recognize that one of these 20s was our median. It was, should have been this one, right? One, two, three, four. Yeah, so this is our median point. So I'm going to look at this piece and this piece. We got lucky. It's an odd, so right on that center point. And then, what is the median of each of these sections that I've now circled? So, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. So, this is my median, and here's my other median. So, this is what we would label as Q1. This is what we would label as Q3. It's as simple as that. Q1 is 10, Q3 is 30. So, how do you determine the IQR? Remember, it was in that formula in the previous slide. It is simply 
Yeah, I keep moving my pen. Q3 minus Q1, so this becomes 30 minus 10, which is simply 20 minutes. So that's that interquartile uh, range. What is the purpose of this? We're about to use it. We're, we're going to understand it in just a moment. Um, but I just want to talk about that resistance for just a second. The quartiles and the interquartile range are resistant because they are affected by a few, they are not affected by a few extreme observations. Um, for example, in this example, if you had an outlier, we know that we had 60, but let's say somebody said 600, your Q3 would still be 30 because that 60 would turn into a 600. Your Q3 would still be 30. So in this case, uh, you would call it resistant. If that Q3 and Q1 changed because of those crazy outlying numbers, then you would say that it was not resistant. Okay. So I've got a second example. Again, I'd like to see if you could have attempted this on your own. I'll give you a hint. Put it in order. Find that median point. But in this case, because it's an even example, I'll give you another hint. You don't want to have just one number on the center. You're going to sp split it right in between numbers 10 and 11. <laughs> Values 10 and 11. Sorry, I got hiccups. But... You're going to get an IQR range, and you're supposed to interpret it. And the best thing I could tell you is that here is, here is my sentence for the interpretation. The range of the middle half of travel times for the New Yorker in the sample is 27.5 minutes. That is the interpretation. Can you get to that point? I'd like to see if you can. All right, let's quickly talk about outliers. There is a rule of thumb. It's uh, that you want to do 1.5 times the IQR. So now you know how to solve for an IQR. So 1.5 times the IQR above or below that, that is an outlier. So if you find a value, if one of your sample sets is 1.5 times the IQR above or below, that is what we call an outlier. That's an official outlier. So let's solve one. We... Here is the answers for example six, because I knew it was coming, so that's why I asked you to kind of do it. So let's dive into it a little further. You should have found that Q1 was 15, Q3 was 42.5, and the IQR was 27.5 minutes. I did mention that in my interpretation. One more time, for the example six, the interpretation is the range of the middle half of travel times for the New Yorkers in the sample is 27.5 minutes. Okay, does the 1.5 IQR rule identify any outliers for the New York travel time data? So let's see what that looks like. Okay, so I would do 1.5 times 27.5 and I would get a value. I've already done that math and so where did I put it? What how? Okay. Oh, I wrote it in here. That's where I did it. Okay, so for this data, 1.5 times that 27.5 becomes 41.25. So I subtract. My first Q1 was 15. 15. That's the that's the lower end. 15 minus 41.25 gets us negative 26.25. The higher end, our Q3, was 42.5. So if you add that 41.25, then you get 83.75. So was there anything? In this data right here, was there anything that was lower than negative 26.25? No. Was there anything that was higher than 83.75? In fact, there was 85. So you actually do have an outlier in this sample set, and that's the uh, sample of 85 minutes that a New Yorker reported for their travel time to work. Okay. Looking again at this stem plot, the only outlier is the longest travel time, 85 minutes. The 1.5 IQR rule suggests that the next three longest travel times, 60 and 65, are just part of the right tail of this skewed distribution. Okay, so this is saying that this distribution would look like this. So it is skewed to the right, okay, where your mean, your median, and your mode and then over here is that outlier, but this is still 60 and 65, so it's still part of your actual skewed distribution. All right, so let's move on to our next example. We're talking about the travel times to work in North Carolina. So we're going back and forth between that North Carolina and New York one. We're now trying to figure out if 60 was an actual outlier. I mentioned it before, but was it mathematically an outlier? Was it that 1.5 times the IQR? So the first thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to determine our Q1, our Q3, and our IQR. And I think we did that in example five. So I'm going to pull that information. 
this was 10, this was 30, and this was 20, okay? So 1.5 times the IQR, this one I don't think I did, oh yes I did, is 30. Oh, that should have been easy enough, 1.5, 1 1.5 1 times 20 is 30, okay? So this is my IQR, so I do 10 minus 30, 30 plus 30, so this gives me negative 20 and 60. So is it quite large enough? Unfortunately, it's right on that cutoff, so it's right at 60. So we wouldn't necessarily call it a true outlier because it falls right on that upper cutoff value, but this is how you would test it because a lot of us thought, okay, 60, that's absolutely an outlier. It's just weird and it's out there and it's on its own, but if we look at the mathematical interpretation of what an outlier is, it barely made the cutoff, but it technically made the cutoff. So it's not a true outlier. It is not a true outlier. Okay, so very briefly at the end, I'm just going to talk about something called cussing and BSing. So I know we haven't really hit box plots, um, and we'll hit it a lot more in 1.3. We kind of briefly introduced it. Schmoop introduced it. I had a worksheet for you. You kind of understand what a box plot is, and that's great. But we're just going to use it to describe something. So again, what does cussing stand for? This is our center, um, our unusuals, our spread and our shape, and BS stands for be specific. Okay, so this is what we mean when we're cussing and we're BSing. So, a lot of information. It just kind of talks about what that box plot is showing, and again, this box plot is, it's vertical. Y'all are kind of used to it horizontal. It's okay to do a box plot vertical because this is a comparison data. We're doing North Carolina versus New York, so you can actually look at what's happening. You can visually understand that comparison. So let's actually compare. Let's discuss the comparison based off of shape, center, spread, and our unusuals or our outliners. So I'm going to start with my cussing center. It appears that travel time to work are generally a bit longer in New York than in North Carolina. The median, both quartiles, and the maximum are all larger in New York. There's nothing that I've guessed. Everything is based off of the box plot data that I'm seeing itself. So let's talk about you and cussing. Those unusual. So I'm going to talk about the outliers. Earlier, we showed that the maximum travel time for 85 minutes is an outlier for the New York data. There are no outliners, outliers in the North Carolina sample. Remember, we said 60 wasn't quite an outlier. Finishing my cuts, we're going to talk about shape and spread. So shape. We see that the graph from both distributions are right skewed. For both states, the distance from the minimum to the medium is much smaller than the distance from the median to the maximum. Spread. Travel time are also more variable in New York, as shown by the lengths of the boxes, the IQR, and the range. So I recognize that you guys are not going to be able to make concise sentences like this just immediately. We will work towards it, but I've given you an idea of what you're working towards. So that's what I mean by use your cussing and your BSing. That's all I've got for you guys, so I'll see you in class next week.